But the Gospel of John opens with this eternal beginning. In the beginning of the beginning, the infinite Father, Son, Holy Spirit there. The Word was there in the beginning. And then in Genesis 1, we read one of the other types of in the beginnings we see in Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This beginning is different than the beginning before that beginning, but it's still being referred to as in the beginning at this point of creation in reference to the creation in which we now experience in the beginning. God was the one there making this happen in our creation as we know it. But here in 1 John and throughout the letter, we're introduced to another type of beginning. The one who existed from the beginning, whom we've heard and seen, we saw him with our own eyes, we touched him with our own hands. In this beginning, when we saw him with our eyes, and we touched him with our hands, he is the word of life. The kind of beginning we see in 1 John is a relational beginning. Let me give you an example of a relational beginning on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't think he was going to get through this teaching this morning without me introducing my grandbaby, did you? <laughs> he was just born at 6.02 a.m. this morning. I have been in the hospital since 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon and left at about 9.45 to hustle over here. Of course, I wrote Lennox into this message a week ago for an illustration this morning on a relational beginning. And I texted... Brooklyn yesterday and said you know this baby just wasn't coming I texted her yesterday I was like listen you got to have this kid by 9 a.m. tomorrow morning or I am going to have to rewrite a portion of my message and come up with a different illustration for this so get on the move and she did it by 602 this morning she got this thing here in the world so I'm grateful for that but in this beginning it's a relational beginning in the beginning of our relationship I took you into my arms as Lennox goes throughout his life I can tell him about those different relationships and different beginnings in his life I could go back even farther and say in the beginning I met your grandfather when we were both 13 years old and, and the other grandpa, he and I have been friends since we were teenagers. But in that beginning, I can also look at him and say, in the beginning, I noticed your mom, Brooklyn, was hanging out with me when she was 14, 15 years old. She always wanted to hang out with Greg. I thought I was helping to break her out of her shell. I thought I was mentoring her. I had since discovered that she was just using me to get to Zane, who she had a crush on. So in the beginning of this relationship, the beginning of the relationship, this is the beginning that matters. It's the beginning of a relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship has always been available to you, but you only begin it when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's talking about this relationship in the beginning when we saw him, when we touched him, when we walked with him. Last week, Chris, Tina Bond, and I were talking about this passage of 1 John because as we've been working on this series and studying 1 John, uh, she said this to me, and I quote, about this passage, I was struck by the intimate language that the elder uses at the beginning of this chapter. The intimacy of the words, hear, see, touch. This is a very deep knowing and familiarity here. And even though the author seems to have been physically present with Jesus when he was on this earth, he seems to think that his recipients who have never seen or heard or touched Jesus, also meaning us, can have intimacy with him in this relationship too. So she asked the question, so if we can't physically see and hear Jesus, what does it mean for us to have a close relationship with him? who was from the beginning. What could this look like? Or what are some ways that we, over the next seven weeks in studying John, can cultivate this relationship? The touch, the see, the feel, the experience, that relationship with Christ. 
What does it look like for us to experience Jesus so intimately? To feel his warmth, to look into his eyes, to become aware that we are listening to the heartbeat of God. Jesus came to show us what fellowship with God looks like. As you look at the life of Jesus, you'll see a continual dependence on the Father. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I don't do these things. It's not I who accomplish these works. It's the Father who dwells in me. Now, now that's a clue for us, although that might be a familiar passage for you uh, of Jesus continuing to say things like, hey, it's not me who does this. It's the Father who does this through me. He's giving a glimpse to you of what intimacy with the Father can look like. He's the one who is doing this through me. He's continually reminding people that he says only what the Father is saying, that they're not his words, but God is simply speaking through him, leading him to think his thoughts and share his words. Here again, Jesus is showing us what intimacy, touching, seeing, sensing the heartbeat of God looks like. That his thoughts are my thoughts, and that my words are his words, and it's him speaking through me. In doing this, he expressed exactly the mind of God. It is that life that John's talking about. He's talking about, in the beginning, that relationship, that it becomes a new way of living, a new way of reacting to situations and dependence on God. I have no understanding of this. Will my life, for those of you who have experienced it, because of this relationship of the one that I held in my arms this morning before I hustled over here, in the beginning of that relationship, will my life be any different? Grandparents? Because of my relationship with him, will something change in the way that I move and act and, and in my connection with him? Absolutely. And what does fellowship look like? See, we, we talk about fellowship with God and we talk about it in, in an appropriately a lot of times in the terms of spiritual disciplines, of reading the Bible, of spending time in prayer, journaling, fasting, and all of the other spiritual disciplines. And, and those are all things that we do and we encourage. And those are ways of having fellowship with the Father. But as I enter into this relationship with this new grandbaby, what does fellowship look like? What does connection look like? What does connection for Jesus in the scripture to his Father look like? It's the sharing of mutual interests. He's about doing the will of the Father. That's part of the fellowship. It's about mutual resources, the things that the Father has, He has. The things that He has, the Father has. It's mutually serving together, that's fellowship. God and I working in partnership. There are many times that people will say, I just feel God's distant. Connected all day but I feel like God is distant. And people will say things like, I said my prayers this morning. I read the Bible yesterday afternoon, and I just feel like God is distant. And Jesus is showing us that it's being about the work of the Father with the Father that really engages us in fellowship. The challenge to some of us this morning and throughout this series will be, do you want to be more present with the person of Jesus Christ? Do you want to have more presence with the people to whom God has brought into your path? It is in serving together for the kingdom of God. It's working in those mutual interests that we will have fellowship one with another, that we'll have fellowship with the Father for Jesus, it's all that I have I put at his disposal, my mind, my body, my time. True, these things are a gift from God. Your mind, your body, your time are a gift from God. But 
when we are not present with him, we're not making these things available for him to use how he wants. That when we put these things at his disposal, then there's a mutual interest that's happening. Then we're mutually serving. Then we're doing things together, and that's where fellowship happens. That these things are at our disposal to do with what we please. Everything that he puts at my disposal. This is the great beauty of fellowship with God. Look at verse 3. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that your joy we share may be full, may be complete. The result of fellowship with God becomes a result of fellowship with each other and fellowship with God and fellowship with each other is where God begins making that joy complete of us, complete in us. So back to that idea. Do you feel God's presence in your life? Do you long for more of his presence? Do you long for deeper fellowship with him? Then mutually put everything that you have at his disposal. Yes, it's about reading. Yes, it's about praying. Yes, it's about journaling. Yes, it's about fasting. But all of those things are feeding us where we are so that we can get up, move out, and participate in the lives of other believers and people who are lost without Christ. And in that, we discover the full fellowship of the body of Christ. You and I working together in partnership. It's so sad to me that there are people who often will participate in the life of a church. And they'll say, I'm a part of such and such church. And what they mean by that is I come in the door about four minutes after the worship gathering has started. I take a seat. I worship. God fills my soul, gives me the ickly ticklies and tingles. And I hear a message and I go, wow, that's good. They really needed to hear that. I'm glad I was here for those people to hear that. And then we dart out to the parking lot, hop in the car and take off and say that we have had fellowship with God. If your participation in the life of the body of Christ is coming to church on Sunday morning, your joy will never be complete. That your participation in the body of Christ is us together going, what are the mutual interests of our Heavenly Father? To seek and save the lost. And I've come to serve, not be served. To seek and save the lost and to serve others. And when you get out of the Sunday morning worship gathering and you begin with other believers participating and seeking and saving those who are lost, the presence of God that joy, that fellowship becomes really real for us. When we discover that God is actually using us together, it is one of the most exciting, joy-producing things you will ever experience. I've many times seen students in their high school and in their middle school who are passionately seeking after Christ be used in a relationship with someone else in their classroom that's hurting or their parents are going through a divorce or something tragic's going on in their life or this young person has the opportunity to lead someone else to Jesus Christ and see them saved. You will never see a teenager more full of joy when they realize that God himself in fellowship with them is using them to change and help and redeem someone else's life. That is more joy than they get on Christmas morning. It's more joy when they get the boy or the girl that they want. It's more joy than anything they ever experience. I see it over and over again. I see people who are involved into, into the business side of the world that I just catch glimpses of from time to time who are constantly involved in, in making millions of dollars and handling tens and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. But when they see in the place that God has put them, he uses them to work for the one who is seeking and saving those who are lost and serving others, and they actually get to do that in their place of employment. They're more excited about that than any business deal they've ever made. They can make $10 million one week. 
But if they speak into the heart and life of someone at work because they're a follower of Christ, they're more excited about that than the deal they just made. Randy Demian was one of those people. Some of you remember Randy. He passed away. And uh, he was one of those people. Some of my greatest conversations I ever had with Randy wasn't about the deals that he was in, the money that he was making, the money that he was making for his financial firm. We'd talk about that stuff because it's interesting to me. But the only time I would see a gleam in his eye of excitement is when he was talking about how God was using him to speak into someone else's life. That fellowship with the Father of mutually participating in his work. You want to see excitement? You want to see excitement and joy in your life? Participate with the Father in becoming the leader of our preschool ministry on Sunday mornings here at New Start. Build a team and lead a team of people who are working together in fellowship to serve and lead our preschool children who are meeting right now. And you're going to discover the joy that Karen Wilson has. Karen Wilson's been doing it for years, and she's resigning here in a few months to serve in other areas of ministry, and she's been leading our preschool ministry for so many years. But if you want to know what joy looks like, talk about how God has used her and her team over the last seven years or so to speak into the lives of all the preschool children that God has brought into their path. You'll see that joy. You want to experience that joy? Get a hold of Desiree. Tell her you're interested in serving in that and seeing what that level of joy looks like. And that's what John's talking about. A life that was intended to be lived filled with joy does not happen by going to church on Sunday morning and then going on with the rest of your life. That's not where that kind of joy comes from. Excitement that God is using us in in the fulfillment of our relationship with him where we say, my time is yours. My treasure is yours. My abilities are yours. How, like Jesus participates with the Father through 1 John, how can I participate with you in your kingdom? And that's what brings true fellowship among believers. That brings true fellowship among believers. As Christina and I were talking about this message, she said something that I reworded a couple things and added a little bit. Together to say this about the first four verses of 1 John and what John was saying, what the elder was saying about our relationship, seeing, touching, participating in the work of Jesus is what brings our fellowship together. That's where our unity is found and that's where our joy comes from. Christina and I wrote this. Our relationship with Jesus should be our biggest strength of fellowship with others. Our biggest fellowship, our biggest strength of fellowship with each other here at New Start should be our mutual submission to what Christ is doing. So spiritually speaking, we as followers of Christ should have more in common with a North Korean who is a follower of Christ than someone who's going to vote the way that you vote this November and is not a follower of Christ. The vast majority of my friends, the vast majority of the people that we as a church have served in Nicaragua over the years, are, uh, they are Nicaraguan Sandinista Socialist Party members. And we have more in common with them because of our fellowship with Jesus Christ than anything that would ever separate us in politics. Your relationship with Jesus Christ should bring you more fellowship throughout this year than with anyone who is on the opposite side of what you think about politics. Because for New Start, this is going to be a year of unity based on the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So I want to close the message this morning by summarizing this whole series for you. What, why I want you to commit to being here each week is because the thought that we're going to carry as we study 1 John and next week 2 John, then 3 John, then 4 John, then 5 John. So spend some time reading it and studying it. As we study the book of 1 John, 
There's two themes that we're going to be running side by side through all of our teachings, and that is this. That Christ wants to have fellowship with us so that our joy may be complete. And as we have fellowship with him, by making his interest our interest, his thoughts our thoughts, his words our words, his desire of what he wants done in this world, serving the poor, seeking and saving those who are lost, encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ, helping one another in need. As we do those things, that's where we find intimacy with him. And as we find intimacy with him, that in turn turns us around to have fellowship one with another and fellowship with those who are followers of Christ so that we're doing good in this world. It's going to be a challenge for us. And it's going to be a beautiful thing that God does through the teaching of 1 John. I want us to stand together this morning. I want, to, I want us to, as a church to make a commitment in prayer this way. That we'll study 1 John during the week. That we'll get involved in something outside of the Sunday morning worship gathering. Because it really is true fellowship is about more than reading in the Bible and praying. True fellowship is about saying, whatever your interests are, they're my interests. Whatever your work in this world is, is my work in this world. I'm going to get engaged in that outside of the Sunday morning worship gathering. And I want to be a part of that. And that's the challenge for us this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for what you've done in our hearts. And we thank you so much for the book of 1 John that as we speak.